Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to the Cheats Movement Podcast on the Family Podcast Network. I am so excited about our next guest, our next conversation. Um, I told everyone that 2022 is going to be special, and it hasn't let anyone down so far, including myself. Uh, Joining me on the show is Lonnie Murray. Lonnie is a major league baseball agent, but get this, not only is she just a major league baseball agent, not only is she uh, the CEO of her own company, she is the first ever black woman to be certified by the major league baseball players association as a major league baseball agent. And to date, uh, we'll, we'll get into this about what comes after, uh, her pioneering status, but we often use the words pioneer too much. We cannot overemphasize the fact that Lonnie Murray is a true pioneer. Lonnie, welcome to the Cheats Movement Podcast. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm, I'm so excited. I'm so excited about this time of year. Baseball is uh, here in many aspects, but right around the corner uh, for Major League Baseball debuts and Minor League Baseball debuts. Uh, being a baseball agent is very different from being a sports agent in any other major sport we think of in the United States. Can you tell our audience and and tell me what makes being a baseball agent so unique and so different? Because I know it's different from say basketball or football. (laughs) Well, the most glaring difference is that you are poor a lot longer. Uh You know, there's this huge misconception with respect to agents being all kind of lumped in together, uh, you know, um, across the board with sports. Um, With basketball and football, you have clients that are generally being drafted out of high school, and that's an immediate payday. They're going, there's no minor league system that they have to enter into. In baseball, when um, you have a client that's drafted, they're going right into a minor league system. So you're not going to see any other form of payment um, for anywhere from five to seven years if the player makes it at all. Mm -hmm. And also if the player sticks by you because there's nothing that binds a player, a baseball player to a baseball agent, there's no contract. Mm -hmm. Um, So they can leave, you know, literally at any time and you have a lot of, more unscrupulous agents who don't necessarily believe in putting the work. It doesn't fit their business model. They'll go try to poach guys from agents who have put in the work and they'll hit them up when they get to double A or triple A, or once they've started their, their big league service time clock. That's a good point. How do you approach, you know, recruiting, scouting, bringing in talent? Because like you said, you're dealing with, in many iterations, high school, possibly juniors that are high profile, high school seniors, and then they have a choice whether they get drafted, they go right to the to the minor league system or they go to college. Then in college, unless this has changed, they can get drafted after what their sophomore year, junior year, senior year. Uh, it's just a lot of maintenance for folks that are not bringing revenue into your camp. Yeah, you. so for example, um, I'll give you two different scenarios. One is a kid who, um, and and there's a ton of scenarios, but generally if you have a kid that's coming out of high school, you you can no longer wait until like that senior year, unless you're generally poaching from someone else, or if that player is unhappy with the representation that they have. Usually if a player has had you until their senior year and they bounce, it's typically because they're not doing their job unless you just have an agent who's um, maybe overloaded themselves and or doesn't really know how to put in the personal care um, because that's a very nervous time for guys. So let's say on average, you're picking up a guy that you think is a dude as a sophomore in high school. And then you're carrying him until he's a senior um, in high school. And then the decision has to be made. Mm -hmm. 
So I've had guys that, you know, have made the decision to go ahead and sign out of high school. But keep in mind that 73% of players on the big league field as of this day were drafted out of college. And Mm. so that gives you something to think about as far as the trend of or the mentality of players that MLB or teams look for. Um, So if you've carried that kid, you know, since he was a sophomore in high school, but then he decides or you all as a group decide that college is really the best place for him. That's another on average three years. Mm -hmm. So. He's got to go, if you break it down and look at the fact that you make, uh, you know, on average 5% of that signing bonus once he gets drafted. You know, if he's signing is, is a 1 through 10, and I'm saying 1 through 10 overall, then that makes it more uh, worthwhile in terms of dollars and cents. Sure. For me, what makes it worthwhile is the quality of the relationship. And knowing the long-term path that we're on. And I think that's what makes me a bit different too, because I never look at a draft signing bonus as a payday. Okay. You, just, you should never, if you start thinking like that, then you're like, uh, you know, there are other agencies that you you can definitely su- see who they are. Unfortunately, parents don't always see who they are, but they are really casting a very wide net they're dragging anybody in that they can get in. So they don't care if a kid signs for a hundred thousand, you know, or, or more because they're collecting checks, you know, for maybe 30 different, 20, 30 different people. Do you see? Mm-hmm. But one of the things that they're also not doing is they're not carrying that player then through the minor leagues generally. If that player doesn't show promise in that first two, you know, that first one to two years, they're they're really not giving them much attention because you, as the agent, you should be buying that player's equipment. Mm-hmm. So on average, that's about two thousand dollars a year out of your pocket. Out of your pocket. Sure. So if you only made if you build that guy on a two hundred and fifty thousand dollars signing bonus, and you're making five percent of that, right. but then you, you're supposed to pay two thousand every year, and that does not include going and seeing him on the road. And with the cost of gas right now, I'm sure everyone's thinking about that. (laughs) And then the meal, you know, you're not generally taking them to Mickey D's. That should not happen. Um, And so just making them feel special. Um, And then for me, I've never charged a player who decided to sign for 250 or less. Um, For me, again, not only because I don't look at that draft time as a payday, but that might be the only check that that kid ever gets. Right. Because as a $250,000 sign, you got to bust your ass to be seen in that organization. You've really got to shine. You have been lauded for what uh, folks describe a holistic approach uh, in regards to caring for the people that you work with, caring for your clients. Um, When you look at your job in, in relationship to someone that's kind of under your umbrella that you have a relationship with, you've established trust with, what's kind of what's the key uh, element of your job? Is it making sure he plays well in the field, making sure that he has a support system where he goes, making like, what is it that you look at and say, this is going to put uh, these scenarios will put my, my players in the best position to succeed. Well, there's no cookie cutter approach. That's first and foremost. And um, people in general, I think like to approach things um, with some sort of one size fits all mm-hmm. sort of, you know, approach. And that's that's across the board in different industries even. Um, for me, I definitely look at each player as an individual. So one player, my advice to one player is completely different than another. Last night I'm sitting up until one o'clock in the morning messaging or talking or messaging and talking with a <laughs> bunch of different guys. Um, and it's different with, with each person, you know, one guy it's, I'm going to need you, you know, last year, I want you to look at this, this, and this. Okay. Like I may send them a video from last year and it could be not necessarily a video of him hitting or pitching. It could be a video of him walking across the field. It could be a video that I took of him walking off the field into the locker room. 
but there, because there's a body language, there's something that indicates to me what is happening or what isn't happening with that player. And so, like I was saying last night, it's, I'm saying to this dude who his team even regards as a future major leaguer, like there's no question about it, but I'm telling him, here's what I'm gonna need to see this year. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you bad. Cause when I first said your swagger, I'm gonna need to see some Vlad Jr. Tati swagger. And he was like, you know, I got swag. No, bruh. No, 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 no. <laughs> you got swag. Yes, you do. But you're not bringing that energy. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna need that energy because you are that dude. You have that ability. So let's not take it easy. And that is oftentimes a separator for guys is that the energy that they bring to their craft. They rely on the physical ability, but they're not bringing it all. How and do, that's what I try to get from my guys. How do a lot of your players and parents, because I know for you, you've basically had to be truth teller in chief. You've had to give people really concrete, strong guidance for yes. their careers, whether it's on the field or off the field. How are they receptive? I know every individual is different, but <laughs> you are you are unique. You are a black woman in a white male dominated business and industry. I'm sure you've been challenged several times by parents and dads and uncles that say, oh, what is what do you know about the game? Even though you've been doing this longer, probably than they've been watching the game. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how is that kind of approach of just hey, I'm going to give it you like it is. How is that often received? Um, as uh, over, what, what I would say is that generally speaking, at the point that someone is with me, um, it's often received very well, more often than not. Now, there are definitely situations and it is, Unfortunately, I'm not stereotyping in my experience. It has always been the dad um, Mm. that is just very resistant and does not like hearing the constructive feedback with respect to their son. Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. see. And, you know, it's like, and, and so it's twofold though. It's one, not just because I'm a woman, it's also because I'm telling them something about their child that they, maybe they didn't even recognize. Mm-hmm. And so who does she think she is? Right. And so for me, <laughs> I've gotten to a place where I'm like, bruh, take it or leave it. Mm-hmm. Because what I know at the end of the day is that you may leave me but I'll be damned if I sit here and water down the message, waste my time and your time, because I know if I don't say this, then he's not gonna have the success that you're expecting. And then I'm gonna be the one that's blamed. But in addition to that is I'm not being authentic to who I am and to what I know. And if I hold back on the truth, then I'm just as responsible and I don't want that responsibility. So I'd rather you walk which has happened, Um, but the really incredible part, and I say incredible because if you left me, then um, (laughs) (laughs) I have not, I have not seen success from those individuals. Sure. Sure. That makes sense. So it, it is what it is. And I'm not gloating or I'm just saying. Right. No, right. Then you get the Claire Hostable. <laughs> well, I was saying, you, you look, you are not a mute. You, like, you have the look, like every, look, every wise, wise auntie, mother. Yes. You have the look, yes. and, and you don't even have to be looking at anyone. You can just, you just yes. know. You can just see what happens. Yes, no, yes. And I feel uh, bad for the kids in those sure. situations sure. because sure. I know that they're catching it from both sides. And, you know, um, it's too bad that. Um, it causes so much issue um, for certain individuals to sure. just try to step back and receive and dialogue over it. You know, oh, absolutely. Um, very unfortunate. Now, you've, I've heard you describe your kind of career journey as almost like an evolution of life uh, yes. in, in, in many ways. How are you, the, 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 the agent, the CEO, because 
a lot of this truth talk not only applies to talking to to parents and kids, but it also as you're running a business, you have mm-hmm. to you have to have that kind of honest, brutal truth in there as well. Um, how have you changed, become better, improved um, as you've gone through this professional career that you kind of described as an evolution of life? What's different from when you just started out to where you are now? Because maybe a couple of years ago, you wouldn't have been like, hey, I'm out. You might would have worked uh, and drove yourself mad, pulling, you know, pulling your hair out over some stubborn folks. Oh, do you know what's funny is that I still get to a point where I'm pulling my hair out and <laughs> trying really hard. Um, and I try really hard because I don't want to give up on the kid. Sure. Um, I'll give up on a dad all day long. Sure. But it's not the kid and I don't, I want the kid, I want to know that in five years, if that kid finds success, that he knows, I know that it's going to play in his head that Lonnie told us this, or Lonnie said this would happen. I found a way, but ultimately I got back to what she was saying that I should do. And now I've been able to do it. And that way he always knows, I I don't want anyone to ever think that I gave up on them or didn't believe in them. Make sense? Sure, absolutely. Um, And so there's that. Now what's different Um, for me now versus then is I used to um, care what people, I worked really hard to prove myself. Mm. And now I don't, I just do what I do. Mm -hmm. I don't, and so the process may be the same, but the intent is very, my intention is very different. My intention now is just to continue working really hard to where if another agent approaches my client, they're like, oh, pff, I, I, I can't even talk to you, bruh. Like either because they're fearful or, <laughs> or because they know that I know this bitch right here. Like she don't has me. She's holding me down and there's no way that I can even consider going somewhere else. Ladies and gentlemen, the voice you are hearing is Lonnie Murray. She is CEO of SMP. She is a certified baseball agent, certified by the Major League Baseball Players Association. Uh, She's also pioneer in the sense that I believe in 2015, you were the No, somebody told, no. It's your, it's it's your, your bio page is wrong. That's what it is. Well, somebody said, um, a, a gal with the Washington Post the other day, yes. and I think the universe is speaking to me because um, this guy sent me a message on LinkedIn saying something about your Google profile and how many of us have Googled ourselves. And I thought, I was like, I've never Googled myself. Right. It just you happened should. like a week we ago. Should. So when and did you become when The other you become day, certified? the gal from the Washington Post prints this um list me in the article and she's like in 2015 and blah 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 and I was like I called her and I was like where did you get this information she was like your Wikipedia I was like who does that I've never done a Wikipedia somebody else set it up yeah you're just yeah you're way behind way behind Lottie I'm not I'm an old lady don't get it twisted like when when did you become certified the, um, I got my cer- first certification for player maintenance through, I think it was 2008. Okay. And so, <laughs> yeah, but, I've been doing this a very long time. And so, and so here's the thing. I, I can't, took over if, SMP look, in 2015. Look, if the Washington Post is wrong, I don't feel bad. You know no. what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? No, no yes. but, but this is, this is a, a critical, um, because, um, in 20, 2008, excuse me, you yeah. said, yeah. You were the first African-American woman. Is this, is this? Oh, yes. Um, so um, Amber Sabathia got certified this year or last year. She's... And that's Cece's wife. Correct. Okay. Yes. So now there's two of us, Roland. So just, so just think about that. <laughs> like, like, really, really, do you, I know you are busy and I know you uh, have a lot to do and a lot of fun. We've just talked about all of this. Yes. When you were going through that journey um, of, of, of the evolution of becoming certified and becoming, say, hey, I want to be a baseball agent, I want to be a sports agent, and so forth, when did it dawn on you that you looked around and said, yo, no one else in this room looks like me? Uh, 
And did it matter? I know it didn't matter for you to move forward, but it was like, did, did, is this, or do you process this? Um, I don't. Okay. Well, there, that's that's two parts because yeah, on sure. one hand, I don't look at it. I I never looked around and was like, "Hey, where are the women?" On top of that, where are the black women? Um, now, when I go to the ballpark, you can feel it, um, especially when I, you know, my first few years because um, there weren't any agents, any female agents that go out and pound the pavement and walking up to dudes like, "Hey." <laughs> Right, right. You need right, <laughs> and I don't do it like that. I do not. Like that. Sure. But, or even a parent. It's like these awkward looks. So not only are there awkward looks from white and black men True. that are out there, because I hear all the time, even from brothers, like, "You work in baseball? Like sure. what? Like sis?" Um, and guys that are in the game. So it was really incredible and so um you know there would obviously be some discomfort i'd get messages from guys that would you know look out for me because i was so oblivious to some things i i would have tunnel vision by choice mm. um i would just try to do my job and so then um if i'm walking around the ballpark this is one example um have you ever been to long beach state no no okay uh, the, dirt, so, the dirt the dirt bags i'm familiar yes, but i've never yes. been yet. So the way that their ballpark works is um, it, you know, all the seats are facing the ballpark and you can go outside of the stadium to walk around to get to the other side. Right. Well, why would I do that? You know, so I just walk in front and then I get a text one day from one of the scouts like you, you should walk out and then walk to the other side, don't walk across. And so what he explained is that because then everybody's Everybody's kind of watching, yes. you yes. know, and hyper analyzing whether it's for good reasons or bad, yes. <laughs> you know? And so it's like to draw less attention to yourself, even like pulling out a gun at a ballpark, uh, a radar gun. Um, I, was like, ballpark. I, was like, I was like, hold on, everybody's gonna look at you then. Yes, <laughs> yes. And then it's like, you know, you know that some people are like, what is she doing? You know, people that don't know who you are or whatever. Um, but now I have a, um, I, I've been around for a while. So people pretty much know who I am. Um, and so I can't say that it's bothersome. I think what's bothersome about it is the process and the unfortunate nature of the system that will make it difficult for other black women or men to um, be involved at the certifi certification level. Well, well, let's talk about that a little bit because I just um, learned about what it took to be a certified agent in the NBA. I just, I just learned that, you know, you needed an advanced degree and then you needed to pay for a test. The test is only offered once a year. You have to be certified, uh, in different states or you know or you have to be represent you have to pay fees to different states of players you represent it was a the finance this is before you even sign a client the yes. financial burden on anyone that was trying to get into the industry was very difficult on that side what are the barriers because again if it's if it's you in 2008 and and now there's there's one other uh, woman of color that came with, within the last two years what is it about this industry? What are the biggest barriers? Are there financial? What, what is happening that hey, makes it so hard? Let me, let me be clear. You can be an agent in baseball and not certified by the Players Association. So you can be an agent and then there's a certified agent. The only distinction between being certified and not certified is that a certified agent to get your certification, you have to go through the process, but you also have to have a guy that is on the 40 man roster. Okay. I got you. I got you. So for example, there are several agents who are out there who do not have their certification, but they could have been doing this for 10 years, but nobody that they represent has ever cracked 
you know, the 40 man roster. I get it. And that's the really unfortunate part. There's a woman by the name of Sylvia Lind, um, Cuban woman. And I say that because representation on all levels is important. Absolutely. And so this woman was at one point the highest ranking female in the commissioner's office. And she's not certified. Mm. Do you see? Absolutely. And Absolutely. Shit, she could probably blow me out the water when it comes to processes and procedures mm -hmm. um, related to representation. You know, fortunately she's a friend, so I'll just pick a brain. But, you know, um, she she's awesome and deserves to be certified, but unfortunately having a player. So if you think about the fact that, um, only 6%, currently 6% of players on the major league field are of African-American descent, mm -hmm. then when you're going out as a person of color, um, trying to represent someone in the other 73% or-, or Sure, you know, absolutely. Um, then that can make it a little bit difficult, you know, um, because we aren't very well represented. You know, I don't pretend not to have um, an element of privilege. I, I don't pretend that. I know that when we start breaking it all down, there are several factors that play a role outside of me being me, mm -hmm. that play a role in my being able to sit in this position. And I'm honest about that because it's not fair to those that are busting their ass trying to make this work to think that, um, you know, I just had some magic wand or I'm just so special. I think that anyone with passion and, you know, some level of intelligence is capable. That's that's phenomenal. It, let's talk about the 6% because you are the perfect person to ask this question. And mm -hmm. a lot of people smarter than me <laughs> that have followed baseball since, you know, Definitely the late 70s, mid 80s. Everybody will tell you that the representation, especially in Major League Baseball, has gone down since that time in regards to the, the numbers. There's a slight upticks in some years, but overall, it's not where the 18 to 20 percent at one point was. And, and there's a lot of reasons why. What would you look at as someone that's around the game and around young people in the game and, and, and following um, what can be done? in communities, especially of color, especially of African-American. Now, I'm not talking because I, I, I understand um, that it's a global game and I understand that uh, Latinx players have, are doing are, are, are growing every every expeditiously. African-American players are going down. Yes. What can what can we do to encourage community baseball or, or, or just increasing the numbers of participation amongst African-Americans in the United States? You know, th that is such a, a loaded and unfair multi question. Multifaceted <laughs> answer. And so um, uh, there are some amazing coaches out there that are absolutely community based and doing their part. And like, I cannot, there, there are probably six or seven off the top of my head and another good amount of organizations that are community-based um, that don't, that also don't get the recognition that they should have um, to send a message across other communities. Like they truly lead by example and, um, there, there are some great groups, you know, um, Black Boys Do Play Baseball on Facebook. Um, over, well, last I checked, it was uh, checked, it was over 8,000 members. And these are families and young men that, you know, want to be in the game. And so I think that um, one of the things that we really have to look at is I, I, I too am guilty of solely blaming MLB, or at least giving the impression that MLB is the cause, and, and they're not. Um, are there solutions that they can absolutely enact? Thousand percent. Mm -hmm. um, but when we look at the difference between, you know, you, you, you talked about between the 70s and the 80s and the representation, we also had um, better community access. Okay. And community access started changing, particularly in California. 
um, during, and you work in politics as well. Yeah. So during the Reagan years, when a lot of the community-based um, funding was cut mm -hmm. and th that community-based funding, you know, really provided support to families that couldn't otherwise afford what we now call travel ball. Yep. You know, kids were still playing every weekend. We act like travel ball is new. Travel ball is not new. Travel ball is not new. Dave Stewart, Ricky Henderson, uh, Gary Pettis, all those dudes were playing travel ball. And, um, you know, the fee may change, but shit, inflation. Okay. So when um, that funding was cut, you can see a direct correlation in the number of kids, if you look at it, right? You, you could see a direct correlation in the number of kids that then started to transition onto professional ball. The other thing that MLB did do that changed with the transition from drafting kids, athletic kids, which are generally, you know, black kids who have shown, um, a propensity for more athleticism and you know faster twitch all of that good stuff but you've also seen stealing bases and more of the athletic approach kind of be frowned upon you know do we see some of that transitioning back absolutely but when you know what was it just a couple of years ago we're frowning on um you know the antics in the field and players showing their personality sure but you had ozzy doing backflip running out the dugout like, i often think about that i often yes. think about what uh, you know what they would say about an ozzy smith in 2022 yeah. right? you had ricky henderson and most people don't know this story this is hilarious ricky henderson drew um, circles on the front of his cleats and his boy Fred Atkins was like bruh those are some nice new white cleats what are you doing and he was like I'm putting headlights on them <laughs> like, you know and so it's just these things and so um, so you have that and then you have families in our communities in our underserved communities being unable to really afford the the college route sure. and so when you have a system that is designed not to support the kids who sign for lesser dollars, then you're not going to see that transition to the big league level. The other thing that I would like to, to add in there is that we as a community have a huge responsibility. I, for one, would love to stop for us to stop saying our kids don't like to play baseball. Right. That is garbage. Uh, yeah, that's that nothing further from the truth. Yes, and when I hear us say that about us, that you want to talk, sure, you know, sure. mommy mode. I <laughs> like, you know, I don't know you, but I'm finding you on Facebook or wherever. Um, I, it's troublesome because we're sending a bad narrative and we're giving others an excuse sure, for sure. keeping us out. And so, like I said, it's multifaceted. I could go on and on about No, that. I love, I love, I ask everyone, I just had, um... Xavier Shrugs on the show not too long ago. And I asked him to say, I ask anyone because we are, it's something where you mentioned the 6%. Well, that 6% is what, 4.2 in Division I, One baseball? Yeah, uh, but I'm going to add one more thing that's sure, going to some people a problem. Okay. When I look back and I, or look back in all my years, or I talk to players, <laughs> um, at all levels from, you know, back in the day, day, we can look, we can go back as far as listening to Buck O'Neill talking about what sure. they used to do as a Negro league player in the community, going back to their community. They had presence. Okay. Mm -hmm. All the way through. I do. I'm sorry. But when we talk to our boys that are now coming up, or the, this this gap that we're missing, where's the presence? Where's the presence of the major leaguers that had made it? Sure. We got into this mindset that we leave the community and then we're gone, or we think that dropping off bats and balls or sending a, a few dollars is going to make, it, it absolves you of any community responsibility or that that's doing your part. You can't throw money after a bad system. You right. have to have a presence if you want to inspire and motivate. 
You can't just be on the TV chasing your bag and think that that means. So how do you approach that? Because you're at the field, you have players that you represent and you see, you know, they're in, especially if they're in double A or if they're in triple A, they've got a lot of time to be in local communities. Like we have a double A franchise. Matter of fact, the San Francisco Giants, the Richmond Squirrels, who are wonderful community partners right here in Richmond. But how, how do you have those conversations with your players, especially players of color of, hey, you know, they're local high schools, local Youth leagues, how, 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 do, how do you do those conversations? With my players, what's interesting is they don't um, fight me on anything. If I suggest something, sure. they, um, they are so awesome um, in, in giving That's great. and in presence. They will literally do anything that I've asked them to do. And then when something comes up and someone else asks them to be engaged in something, you know, they'll usually talk to me about it. Some don't, some just do it. And I think that's great. Um, but yeah, we've done stuff all across the board. Like I, everything from best buddies program to girls to like, whatever. That's amazing. Lonnie, I've got a couple more. You've been so gracious in general with your time and your honesty. It's this fun. has been phenomenal. I've got, a, I've got a couple more that I definitely want to hit at that um, I just – you are a good person to ask about. It's the, the perfect person to ask these questions that I've never been able to ask. Um, and the first one's pretty obvious, um, especially in Major League Baseball. We know about the lockout. We know yeah. that they've struck a deal. Baseball is back. They're going to get all 162 games in. I think was a shortened spring training a bit. Um, from an agent perspective, from a uh, player perspective, in that sense, when you look at it now, and the dust has settled a little bit, when you look at their back on the field, uh, who who won? Like, how does, <laughs> okay, talk. I was it talk to me about this. Like, how how like what was that time like for someone uh, in your position? And then, you know, how how, how do you think it shaked out? Um, first of all, let me say that <laughs> I will tell you it's funny. Like, yeah, I'm a mom. So there's this thing where they think that I have, you know, eyes in the, that I do, I have eyes in the back of my head. And, um, but I also have great intuition. Again, I'm a mom. So back before the season started, I kind of told them everything that was going to happen. And my timeline was dead on. Oh, wow. So there was nothing that was really a surprise. I didn't go through a lot of the things that maybe a lot of other people went through. I wasn't like in a panic or, and my guys every once in a while, it'd be like, well, what do you think? And I'd be like, same thing I said before. Like I would literally <laughs> say that because I was so, you know, like proud of the fact that they were prepared. They mm -hmm. were 1000% prepared. So no one was um, caught off guard. Now, as far as one, it's sad to say because the whole term one is very difficult when it comes to things that should have been in place anyway. And there are, in some regard, there are players that lost. And that's generally the guys who were Rule 5 eligible this year that lost the opportunity to, to be assigned or traded to um, or drafted by another team if they weren't listed on the 40 man by their current team. Okay. Um, that absolutely sucked. But at the same time, when you're looking at the big picture um, of, for all players, then it, it made sense why the Players Association had to do it the way that they did it. Um, I was, I, that was funny because I was hot. I was hot. Really? So I called and I was just like, you know, it was one of those where you go a little bit hard and then you're like, Dah -dah -dah. oh, okay. Um, <laughs> you know, and you back up like, yeah. Okay, with perspective, that helps. Um, but overall, the Players Association, Tony Clark, the, the team, they did a fantastic job. The player reps, um, I love how the majority stuck together and did right by the masses versus the individuals at the top of the food chain. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. Now, there's something that's been bothering me for a very long time. Two things about baseball that bother me for a very long time. I'll ask you about this one because you're an agent and this may not be your client. Forgive me if it is and you can't talk about it, but I followed the draft last year 
Um, and I and I followed uh, Vanderbilt because of the number of people of color that they had on there. So you know where I'm going with this. Yep. The Kumar Rocker situation. So again, I don't know if you can talk about specifics, but any player in this situation, it just to me from just somebody on the outside that's a baseball fan looking at the draft that followed his career in the College World Series and Vandy, uh, just feels like this is a tragic situation for a player that gets drafted super early, first round super early, and it seems like the team doesn't want him or there's a physical issue. But now he's in a position where he can't go back to school, and he, he's I guess he's not draft eligible. I, well, he chose I, to go back to school. Okay, yes. I was like, I, yep. I need to understand, and should should I be this angry? And who should I be angry at about a situation where someone has gotten this you know astounding college career, gets drafted, but now there's some medical there was a medical issue and now he seems to be in limbo or no man's land i don't know what's happening now but yeah. should i be as angry as i was when i started hearing I, the story come I was out? pissed i was pissed yes and he's not my client but that was absolutely ups- upsetting because it didn't have to be that way that's at all. that's what i'm thinking yeah. so like what like how does how does something like this happen and well, I could tell you how it happened. The, the bottom line is the reason. <laughs> I, I don't know. I was bad. How, bad okay, bad. so there, that too is multifaceted because how does it happen? I personally feel too many off-speed pitches. That's how the injury part happens. Sure. Okay, that, that's sure. what As a young age, what, crow brawls, all that stuff. Like just even in his college career, okay. like you could look at what was happening and, you know, I, I personally think coach Corbin is a great coach. I think that um, now I've never been coached by him, but um, at the same time, I like the energy that he brings. I like the diversity that he brings to his clubhouse. And so I can't fault him for that. And I do believe that he, as an individual does the best he can for where he is in time and space. So I'll leave it at that. Fast forward that Kumar has a responsibility to himself as well and to his body. And so if something was going on, which clearly there was because you saw the transition, you saw it prior to the draft, you saw the drop in velo, you saw this change, which was glaring to me as an agent because I've been in that situation. And at that point, I'm pulling my guy aside. Literally, I been there, done that. I'm pulling him aside. We're having a conversation. We're getting to the bottom of it. Now here's where things went bad. MLB instituted the combine. Okay. During that combine and even leading up to the combine, before the combine ever existed, you were responsible for disclosing medicals Mm -hmm. to a team. If something goes wrong, if you do not share the medicals, then the team has to evaluate you once you're drafted. If they evaluate you after you're drafted and you have not disclosed your medicals, then it is completely within their right to not take you. So if you thought you were gonna be slick and hide something from the team by not disclosing your medicals, shame on you. So Mm. is that the agent or the player? Who's responsible? Okay. The next part, again, I have been in that situation. I had a kid. We saw the drop in velo, pull him aside. What the heck is going on? What do we do? We, we go outside of the school, mm-hmm. big school. I won't say which one, because I'll probably know who I'm talking about. Hey, yeah, um, no, no, no. And we get an MR, we get a private MRI. Why? Because I want to know what's going on first so that I can prepare the kid mentally before the barrage from coaches, scouts, boom. Like let's, let's deal with the, it's like dealing with stuff in our own house first. Sure. Right. Sure. And then we'll deal with everybody else in an honest way, because if you try to be slick about it now, is there a small percentage chance that you're going to fly by? Yes. Now, This is what you saw. The Mets in past have had a history of not doing a very good job with their medicals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So who tried to be slick? Do you see? I do. Okay. If so, what I, I, I personally did in that situation is I disclosed the medicals to the teams that were interested. 
And I did it to the higher ups. The reason I did that is because on the lower end of the totem pole, there's like all these conspiracy theories that circulate like little boys and girls on a schoolyard. Sure. Okay. I don't need that narrative. My player doesn't need that narrative. He has enough going on with trying to process what's happening with his body and what his future freaking looks like. His future. This is a child's future. Do you see? Absolutely. And so if you can prepare him for worst case scenario and best case scenario, but also provide solutions, you guys are good. So the kid, my kid ends up getting drafted. They still took him in the second round. Why? We disclosed the medicals. This is the first year he's pitching. This was three years ago mm -hmm. because he ended up having the elbow surgery. Mm -hmm. Then there was something with his labrum, but we were honest about it. And we did it in a way that protected everybody. And so with Kumar, I feel bad for him. I feel bad for his family. I'm sure they feel like everything's fine, but it did not have to be that way. And right. I can't imagine, you know, if they're oblivious to you know, what the way that it could have been great. Then they don't know. No, they, 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 nobody can be. Cause I'm on, like I said, I'm on the outside as a fan though. That doesn't have this information. And I'm still like, look, something, something, something went crazy. Yeah. Like, you know, if something I, went crazy. If I told my player, Hey, don't worry about it. We can, we will get by. That's me betting yeah. on the whole money. I'm so hearing you speak. I sh I'm less mad at the Mets Cause I was furious at the Mets. Furious. No. Nope. Furious. Yeah, you know, you, you, okay. You're, you're I'm less mad at the how Mets. How many millions of dollars? I, for... hey, I was, I'm less mad at the Mets today than I was yesterday. Yeah. Now, yes. now I, I, I will, I will leave you on two things because look, if that was the my, more, my first pet peeve, my second, and I know this is a financial thing. This is a commerce thing. And this is a major league baseball thing, but for the life of me, can anybody tell me I'm on the East coast? I know you are on, uh, you're on the other side of the, uh, of the side of the States. Why is the major league all-star game Tuesday at nine o'clock Eastern standard time? That's when it starts. There is no seven year old, like my son who loves baseball that can stay up past the second inning and watch their favorite players. You mentioned Vlad jr. And Tatis and uh, you know, I don't know if it's Cedric Mullins or a, a, a cone. Why is that? That hasn't always been that way. Right. wasn't this all-star game back in the eighties, like Saturday afternoon. Somebody help me with yes. this. Well, I don't care when it used to be. It could have been at noontime or midnight. A bad decision is a bad decision, no matter how many times you make it. Tuesday at 9 8. It does, I mean, it kills me. It kills me. No, rightfully so. Rightfully oh. so. And hopefully, maybe something <laughs> will look, come along and you, say. I'm sure, look, you can make this happen. Some, something in your realm of the world. Um, hey, we put it out in the universe now. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. Let me let me close with this because um, there is so much that you have taken on and so much that you do. And we were talking before the interview started and you were like, I don't take breaks. I can't, um, you know, I don't, 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 don't ask me about, you know, how we take care of ourselves in this time of year. Um, I'm going to ask you about balance because you named uh, obviously a, a agent that's repping players all throughout all of kind of different levels of baseball. And then you're talking to, you know, youth and families that even that, that you hope will one day be doing that. You talked about your own family in which you do have, <laughs> yes. you do have, and you have to take care of that. We talked briefly and we, we should, this is a whole nother interview about being a CEO so it's not just that you're repping players, you're running your own business. Yeah. And that's a whole different level of conversations and meetings and things that you have to do. Uh, how do you work through kind of just typical days, right? Like how, how do you balance typical days where you have players calling you, you have your family calling, you have business partners calling you? How, how do you do that? Well, do you do, well? Do you turn it off? I got three forms of communication available to me. <laughs> There's sign language when you know we're we're here at the house because I have players that stay with me sometimes uh, during the off season and then again during spring training. So that happens. Um, 
I don't, I don't really think about it. And sure. balance is not something that I have. <laughs> I, I have not done that. And it's not that some people don't complain. Sure. Um, but at the end of the day, um, even my family, they respect it. Um, and if hard work and, you know, is what I'm showing my sons, then so be it. You know, I used to keep a jar when they were little labeled future therapy fund. So we're. <laughs> we're oh, man. Well, Lonnie, I, I did lie because I want to get one good one good and on a high note. You've been around a lot of characters and you mentioned uh, the Ricky Henderson story or some other players, but you've been around a lot of characters and what is a obviously a historic game. Can you who's the biggest character? in baseball that you that you've kind of been around and been able to be in in, in the company of uh this character because yeah there's these legendary baseball characters right yeah but i mean then obviously that would probably have to go to dave stewart you okay. know okay. um i don't know if you know because you, you know we live together right <laughs> yes yes lonnie so I oh understand. my gosh, she gets on my damn nerves. And this <laughs> on my nerves, like we go, like there is so much trash talk that takes place when we're under the same roof, even with the kids. Like you should see our family chat. It is. So, so for those that don't know, you are married to yeah. Dave Stewart, who is legendary World Series pitching Oakland Athletic. Class A shit talker. Yes. I did not know about that part, but. But I didn't. I don't. I don't. I didn't know about the about the trash talk. But that's good. It's great. That's great. So that's oh. that's. <laughs> I feel like you can hold your own. I feel like like just from this conversation, I feel like you're holding your own. That's why none of this other stuff means nothing. Like I can walk in a room and not care because I've dealt with that. Like oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> that's I hope hilarious. He's gonna see this. And he's gonna be, hey, he's gonna be looking for redemption. <laughs> well, any, look, anytime he wants to come on for redemption, I got him. Lonnie, <laughs> okay. this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. You are actually pretty witty and funny and slick on Twitter. Where can people <laughs> where can people follow you and find you and keep up with uh, with everything you're doing uh, online, media wise, and uh, SMP as well? SMP Lonnie S Sam Mary Paul Lonnie L O N N I E on both Instagram and Twitter. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it, Lonnie Murray. Uh, this is the Cheats Movement on the Family Podcast Network. We'll close out the show right after this. <laughs> 